Just ahead, there's another edition of the Florida Roundtable, a service of Florida's talk and entertainment networks. I'm Reagan Smith, Public Affairs Director of the Florida News Network. And I'm political analyst Al Spry. It's great to be here, Reagan. We're going back in history. It's always a pleasure to be with you, Al. And yes, we are in the midst of the 150th anniversary of the American Civil War. As a matter of fact, we have just passed the 149th anniversary of the assassination of President Lincoln. And uh, today we're going to take a look back at it from, I think, a point of view that even surprises you and me. And we've spent an awful lot of time looking at such things. It's going to be very interesting indeed. Yeah. Stay put. The Florida Roundtable begins following these messages. This is the Florida Roundtable, the service of Florida's talk and entertainment networks and in the Orlando area of Tough TV 38. I'm Regan Smith, Public Affairs Director of the Florida News Network. And I'm Al Spry, political commentator and man about town. It's good to be here, Reagan. Always a pleasure, sir. Also great to be here on Tough TV. If you're not getting Tough TV, and you can pull it over the air with a nice set of uh, HD antennas. Remember yep. Rabbit Ears? Well, yep, this is the works. new version. Mm-hmm. Also, uh, you can get Tough TV if you go uh, down to uh, the Sears Auto Store in uh, in the uh, Florida Mall here in Orlando. I, w- I walked in to get some tires, and what do you know? They had Tough TV right yeah. on there. Well, all right. I like it. And, of course, you can get it on Channel 69 of the Summit Broadband Cable System. So, Tough TV, it's all over the place. It's growing. It's a great uh, network. Uh, glad to be associated we with it. We are proud to be seen. Uh, is it Wednesday Saturday Wednesday, and morning. Saturday and Sunday at 9 a.m. Yeah, okay. Very good. Well, lots of things happening in this world. Uh, before we get to uh, Thomas Bogar and, and uh, look back across the years of the Lincoln assassination, uh, some current events that we need to talk about. Yeah, I wanted to uh, touch on the Ukrainian situation, of course. The Ukraine uh, is quite a hotbed right now. Uh, the Ukraine, uh, with the Western aspirations, some talk uh, recently about them wanting to join the EU. All of a sudden, Russia wants the Ukraine back. They want the Ukraine because the Ukraine has the oil reserves and the Ukraine has the f- big port there. And they the, went ahead and just took the Crimea went while ahead we watched. Said, we're taking yeah. the Crimea. Yeah. And, and you know, uh, obviously there's some geopolitics playing here. This is also very interesting. There's a series of photos that just came out of gun-toting men wearing green uniforms. Uh, that show uh, that there is a likelihood now that Russian forces are actually operating in eastern Ukraine. Uh, There's uh, pictures available. Uh, The images show Russian sabotage reconnaissance groups acting in Ukrainian towns, Uh, Russian activity in the region. As you know, Ukraine used to be part of the Soviet Union. Until 1954, yeah. Right. And and, and Nikita Khrushchev and whatnot gave them the independence. Exactly. And uh, so now uh, maybe we will see the end of Ukrainian independence. Well, you know, I can't help but think back to the 1930s, and I'm thinking about Adolf Hitler uh, and Neville Chamberlain and the Sudetenland. And what we're hearing now is that there are so many Russians that live in the eastern part of the Ukraine that they deserve to have their vote and be part of Russia again. And, uh, you know, uh, Adolf Hitler used to say that, uh, well, the Germans in the Sudetenland uh, should be part of Germany. And he promised Neville Chamberlain that after the Sudeten model was settled, that that was the end of Germany's territorial aspirations in Europe. Right. He, he said uh, either they're going to be given their freedom or we're going to take it. Of course, Putin hasn't been quite that blunt about it, but they're certainly dancing all around it like they're getting ready to march in there. And I don't know that a visit from the vice president is going to stop any of that kind of thing. He's over there talking to the interim government uh, this week, uh, and we've made all kinds of promises, but we watched them take we we watched them take the Crimea back and and nobody lifted a finger well yeah and and you know really the u s s hands have been tied in regards to this because uh let's face it, Putin is a better politician than the President of the United mm, States at this yeah. time. You couldn't say that uh with previous presidents. I think Reagan had a good handle on how to handle the Russians, yep. obviously yeah. 
Uh, the Russians really were, haven't been in play for a while because they went through their re- reformation in the 90s and 2000s. Of course, then we were focused on uh, terrorism and uh, the Arab states and being in war in, in, uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan. And, and now uh, we find ourselves in a weakened position without much leverage. And I, I think that that's exactly what Mr. Putin did. He sat back and waited, and they pushed a little bit here and tried a little bit there, and they watched until they were quite confident that we had an administration that wasn't going to do anything. Well, we have smacked the fingers of Mr. Putin's business associates who make money. I don't think that that is going to stop a government that really wants to have that territory back. Well, all right. Come for us to uh, take a pause along the network line here. We'll remind you that this is the Florida Roundtable. I'm Reagan Smith. And I'm Al Spry. We're going to be joined by historian and author Thomas Bogar as the conversation continues. We're back. You're listening to the Florida Roundtable, the service of Florida's talk and entertainment networks. I'm Reagan Smith. And I'm Al Spry. And Al, as promised, we are joined on the long distance line here by Thomas Bogar. He is an author. Uh, he's actually uh, got a doctorate in theater history and literature and criticism. Uh, did all that at Louisiana State University, one of my uh, favorite places. And he's got a brand new book out called Backstage at the Lincoln assassination. We are in the midst of the 150th anniversary of of the Civil War, uh, and April 14th was the 149th anniversary of President Lincoln being assassinated. Backstage at the Lincoln assassination. Well, Tom, first let me say welcome to the Florida Roundtable. We appreciate you taking the time to be with us today. Uh, It's great to be with you and great to be in any connection with somebody who would have a reverence for history. <laughs> well, thank you, sir. I, I guess, you know, off off the air, I didn't tell Tom that I do teach history at the University of Central Florida here. You and, teach and, history, and, and, uh, and uh, uh, we both have uh, uh, degrees in history. Yes, so. and, and uh, so Al and I are both uh, very much interested in, in, the, in these things. And that's where I want you to start. Uh, explain to us, and this is what caught my eye, there are over 120 new books out there on the Lincoln assassination. Uh, what, why is yours different, and what got you started into this? Well, when I was working on my last book, which is on presidential theater going, I kept collecting information about uh, when I was working on the Lincoln chapters about the assassination, and I wanted to do some research about who the actors were at Ford's Theater and who was working with it. And I kept looking to see what there was, and I was astounded that there was nothing. I found all these versions that kind of mentally placed the reader in the audience. I found books that followed John Wilkes Booth out the back door to his death in that burning tobacco barn. I found many versions that followed the mortally wounded president as he's carried across the street to the Peterson house and his death there. And I was stunned to find that nobody had written about or researched or seemed to care about the people who are trapped inside, the 46 actors and managers and stagehands who were trapped as the soldiers marched in and the, the audience is swarming up onto the stage and the crowd in the street is chanting, burn the place down. And nobody had done this. And, and with my theater history background, I thought, people forget, you know, that this took place in a theater and it was committed by an actor. And so the real context for this all-important event was that it took place during a theatrical performance. And, and I was really happy to find that uh, this was an area that I could explore and kind of dig into. Now, I, I caught the number 46. And that, that sounds reasonable. You know, if you go and, and see a major theatrical live production, there, it takes a lot of people to make living theater come to life. Mm-hmm. And, and for them, too, the theatrical practice was so different. Uh, you know, when we think of the event of the assassination, we tend to think of it in modern theatrical terms. But when you turn it around and you're backstage in the dark, this was the pre-electric light era. So they're really relying much on a lot more on sound than they are on sight. Uh, I found it was kind of odd how the people perceived the actual shot. Uh, somebody thought it was a paint can exploding in the prop room. Uh, one actress thought it was a champagne 
cork popping. Another one thought it was one lone hand clap out in the audience. So sound became so much important for them. And in terms of the scenic practice, uh, I, I wanted to include in the book some sense of what it was like acting at that time. You know, we, we think of the modern acting styles today, and yet back then it was the, the more melodramatic style. You know, when you expressed grief by thrusting your arm across your forehead, all the, the old melodramatic style. Sure. I, one of the things uh, that you note was that Ford's Theater itself was, uh, and, and when you got 46 people in, in the nation's capital, from, and, and they're on both sides of the issue in this great war, but that Ford's Theater was a hotbed of secessionist and, and Southern sympathy and conversation, and yet the president and his wife went there frequently. Well, you know, it, it's amazing that the whole place didn't explode before then because uh, there was a lot of dominant secessionist thought. Uh, a lot of these people were from Baltimore, and Baltimore during the Civil War was, was a really central uh, gathering of secessionist thought. It was tough to keep Maryland. Uh, they thought it would su- succeed uh, for a little while, and yet... The president loved Laura Keene's performance. He had seen her before. He knew that it was her benefit night. And in coming that night, his attendance would boost the box office for her. Uh, In being Good Friday, which is traditionally not a good theater attendance night back then, uh, he would have ensured that her benefit night would get her more money. And and he was fatalistic about going to the theater. He loved the theater. Uh, He wanted to go. He wanted to be out and among the people uh, and really disregarded many warnings frequently, uh, warnings that, that could have led to serious harm before that even. Uh, And yet the remarkable thing is with all that, you know, backstage working together side by side as they rehearsed and they performed these plays, a different play every night, were Union veterans and Confederate veterans. Uh, One of the men had a son who died fighting for the Union. Uh, Another one had a brother who had died fighting for the Confederacy. So this was just a a swirling tinderbox of emotions backstage. You know, I've noticed that famous people, politicians, uh, often have that same attitude where it's very fatalistic and they always say, well, if they're going to get you... They're going to get you. Martin Luther King spoke about being assassinated. He kind of knew that was coming at some point because of the the nature of politics mm-hmm. and the nature of being a, a large figure in politics. Kennedy too. And Kennedy and and yeah, so uh, it doesn't surprise me that Lincoln would just want to go to the theater. He'd go to the theater. They'd say, "Well, I don't know if it's that safe," but you know they didn't really have a secret service back then. No. Uh, so he, had, he did have one guard who was supposed to be on duty outside the box, presidential box, and yet the guard, Parker, was kind of a lush, was over drinking in the saloon next door. There was another guy who was outside the box, but John Wilkes Booth, being a celebrity, just walked up to him, handed him a card, gained access to the box. It's uh, during theatrical visits, often President Lincoln would have people coming and going to his box with different. Uh, dispatches for the war and different events, so it wasn't that big a deal for a celebrity like Booth. And Booth used to even say, my name is my passport. You know, he could could just go wherever he wanted. Did I note that in some of the visits, uh, when the Lincolns would arrive early, that the president would actually go down by the box office and and be, be behind the man taking the money for the tickets and greeting people and things like that? He loved that. He loved being out and among the people. The one thing that I love in in working on the Presidential Theater book and on this is how much it has emerged to me what a human figure Lincoln was. You know, we think of the Lincoln Memorial and Lincoln on the Currency, and we forget he would go to the theater, and sometimes if it was a really funny, folksy play, and and our American cousin was, uh, he would throw his head back in a hearty guffaw, and he liked to sit there and mingle with the people. He liked the doorkeeper, John Buckingham, at Ford's Theater, so he would sit with him, and uh, I think it took him away from the, the tremendous weight that the war was bearing down on him with and the toll that it took on him to to be out in the escapism of being among the people in a lighter atmosphere. And yet, other times he would go to the theater and um, observers would say that he was lost completely in his thoughts. He wouldn't even seem to be aware of where he was or following the action. 
Well, I uh, wanted to ask you uh, before we go to break, uh, how did you get the information on these 46 people that were in the theater? Were they, were they, uh, was it, how did, was it documented? Gra- gathering of their letters and photos at the Harvard Theater Collection. Uh, but we also have now, anybody who's researching and writing now has all these digital search engines where you can find interviews that they gave in newspapers maybe 20, 40, 50 years later. Uh, that we can do digital searches on uh, universities and the Library of Congress. And the military records, too, now have all been digitized. And you can search by name Confederate Union records or military records all the way back to the Revolutionary War. It's, it's a great time to be researching and writing. Let me ask you this now. You, you say we had 46 theater workers there. Were any of them actually involved in this assassination plot? Well, that's hard to pin down with absolute proof, but I have to say there were some that were incredibly close to John Wilkes Booth, who had known him for years, who were friends of his, close friends, and who were willing to pledge themselves to help him out. Uh, And that's something I'll have to get back to after the break with a little more time. Well, we've got a couple of minutes here to go yet, and uh, oh, good. Okay. you can go ahead. And... Uh, there was one, one actor, particularly John Matthews, who was a close friend of Booth's. Who, um, Booth was always trying to get him to help him with what had previously w- was an abduction attempt. They were going to abduct Lincoln, lower him over the edge of the box, and take him down to Richmond and hold him as ransom to exchange for Confederate prisoners. And that had failed twice before that spring when Lincoln had simply failed to show up. Uh, But Matthews had rented a room in the Peterson House across the street from Ford's Theater a month before the assassination, the very room that Lincoln would die in. And in that room, his good friends, actor Ned Emerson and John McCullough and John Wilkes Booth, had hung around in that room all afternoon in March of 1865. And Booth had smoked a cigar and lain down and taken a nap on the very bed that Lincoln would die on a month later. I had never heard that before. No, I didn't know that either. Wow, there's, some, there's something yeah. new for you. We, we, we're <laughs> learning new things here as, as, as we go along. Did that 46 uh, include the actors in the play? It did. Um, people erroneously think it was Laura Keene's acting company, and you hear that sometimes. But she was just a star who came through with two other actors, Harry Hawk and John Diet. The rest of them were kind of a ragtag group that John Ford had gathered. John Ford was managing five different theaters, so he was constantly circulating this group among them. So they had no sense of union or bond or cohesion, and they were so young. The average age of the cast was under 30, and almost half of them were under 20. So they were young, they were inexperienced, uh, they hadn't acted with each other hardly at all, so there wasn't a sense of um, a bond that might have helped carry them through this tragic evening. And and John Ford himself earlier on was sort of a he he didn't really turn neutral or pro north <laughs> until it was very apparent that the north was winning. Right, he his background, his wife was from the Richmond area, he had family down there. He was essentially a secessionist, a states' rights advocate. Uh, But he knew enough, as it was clear which way the war was going, uh, by about 1864, he knew enough to trim his sails. And for the sake of keeping the theater operating properly, um, he hid his personal feelings and even allowed, uh, he had a beautiful home in Baltimore, he allowed the uh, Union military to build a fort on part of his property. So he, he knew which way the wind was blowing. Well, this was the secessionism of the owner. Was that one of the reasons that the uh, that the audience wanted to burn the place down and stuff, or was that well, had something to do with it? Because of what had happened in the theater, uh, mm-hmm. the theater profession at that time was really looked down upon, uh, and there was a certain amount of resentment toward it. One of the first things Mary Lincoln said is, "My husband cannot die in a theater. That a terrible place." Uh, and it was also thought that uh, even if someone were to die in a theater, that his soul was condemned to hell because of the, uh, <laughs> the really the bad regard that people had for the theatrical profession at that time. So I'm that surprised because too. that was really what, what else could you do? What else did you do? Right? Exactly. Yeah, gentlemen. At this point, uh, we I do have to interrupt and uh, take us up to uh, our uh, next break time here. But I want to remind you that you are listening to the Florida Roundtable. The Service of Florida's Talk and Entertainment Networks. I'm Reagan Smith. And I'm Al Spry. Our very special guest this day is Dr. Thomas Bogar. He is the author of Backstage at the Lincoln.
Lincoln assassination, the untold story of the actors and stagehands at Ford's Theater. And it's from our friends at Regnery Publishing, available at all the fine bookstores around Florida. If you'll stay put, we'll be back in a moment. From Pensacola to Key West and all points in between, you're listening to the Florida Roundtable, a service of Florida's talk and entertainment networks. I'm Reagan Smith. I'm Al Spry. Our very special guest this day is Dr. Thomas Bogar. He is uh, uh, the author of Backstage at the Lincoln Assassination, the untold story of the actors and the stagehands at Ford's Theater from our friends at Regnery Publishing. And it's available at all the fine bookstores around Florida and places like Amazon.com. Uh, it is different than the, I, I hate to say, run-of-the-mill because uh, most of the books that have been written about Mr. Lincoln are important and cover some sort of aspects. But this is truly a refreshing story uh, that has uh, ad, um, angles to it that we are unfamiliar with. Uh, you know, you, you hear about Lincoln jumping off the stage, catching his uh, boot in the flag. You mean the booth. Yes. Uh, yeah. yeah, I'm sorry, yes. Uh, booth jumping down and breaking his, spraining his ankle on the stage, caught in the flag, six semper tyrannis, and out the back door he goes, and, and they shoot him in the barn, and, and you never hear about all of the other people uh, that were in the, th- you know, Booth is yelling at about seven, 1,700 people who were in the theater that night, 46 people working in the theater itself. And uh, we have to say, you know, uh, Tom has, of course, a, a great background. He, his doctorate is in theater history and uh, from Louisiana State. And uh, so uh, I, I guess, it, it, you know, uh, I don't want to say it was an easy step for you, but it was a logical step for you to get involved in this and delve into the history of all of these people. And it is a remarkable history. Well, I, I think of the book <laughs> as killing Lincoln, the view from backstage. It's mm-hmm. turning everything around 180 degrees, and, and that's my background. So I look at every event there is through some theatrical perspective. It's a different lens on things. So uh, let's talk about uh, briefly what happened. So the, uh, from the perspective, like you said, of the people uh, that were performing in the stagehands and so forth. So the, the shot is heard. Pandemonium. And, and let's swoop, let's set the stage. To swoop in so quickly, the remarkable thing I found was that Edwin Stanton, the Secretary of War, and the detectives and the soldiers seemed to know exactly who to arrest among the stage crew. Um, I think I'm pretty sure they must have had some spies backstage, and word must have reached them of, of what the sentiments were backstage. Um, they arrested the managers quickly as well. John Ford, who had been down in Richmond that night, seeing to family affairs. Uh, leaving his 21-year-old brother, Harry, in charge. John Ford is arrested as soon as he gets back to Baltimore. He's held in Old Capitol Prison, which uh, stood, ironically, where the United States Supreme Court stands today. And he's held for 39 days, never charged with anything. Uh, Harry Ford, 20, imagine being 21 years old and being in charge of the theater that night. Harry Ford is arrested and released three times. The, the record of his interrogation alone, which is down in National Archives, is 30-some pages. They grilled him endlessly. Um, and, and yet never charged, uh, the whole affair was so speeded up. Imagine today an assassination occurring in April, uh, an investigation quickly done in May, a trial in June, and then the conspirators who were guilty are executed the first week of July. So hmm. uh, they were holding some people who really weren't connected with it, and then uh, they missed others who were involved to a certain extent. It was not the most thorough, well-handled investigation. I I tend to think of it as kind of a a rush to judgment, but they wanted some closure with it. But imagine that, folks. The people accused of murder didn't spend 17 or 20 years on death row. No, it was swift swift justice back then. Yes. A month or two and you were were toast. No appeals, no lengthy process. 
Um, a whole different scene today. Uh, but let's talk about some of the main characters uh, and, and what became of them after the assassination. Oh, I'm glad you asked. To me, one of the most saddest figures is Laura Keene. Uh, she's the star of that night. It's going to be her big benefit night. She had been in the late 1850s and during the Civil War one of the most famous, powerful, respected theatrical manager actresses in what was essentially a man's world back then. Uh, everywhere she went, she drew huge crowds. And yet from that night on, the first, her first instinct that night was her, her managerial, her professional instincts kick in, and she walks to the edge of the stage, tries to quiet the audience that's just seething, hysterical, and doesn't have much success. And then she goes around through a back route up the stairs and through the apartment next door and around into the presidential box where she cradles the head of the dying president. Uh, she descends the stairs afterwards, her dress is soaked in blood, um, and she tries to go on to her next engagement. She's supposed to be performing next week in Cincinnati. She tries to leave. She's arrested in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, held for two and a half days, and her whole career just goes down from there. It spirals downward. They, they think of her too much as associated with the assassination. Uh, people in the South think she's a Yankee. And then, worst of all, she uh, acquires consumption or tuberculosis. And even the, being at the height of her career that night at age 39, she's dead by 47, almost oh. impoverished. Wow. So really, it's, it's sad what happened to her. Um, probably the saddest case, there was this, this poor abject drudge of a stagehand, uh, this guy Ned Spangler. His wife had died the summer before, and he had taken a drink. He was just a, a good-hearted but childlike drudge who was a friend of John Wilkes Booth. He had helped build the Booth family home in Bel Air, Maryland. And that afternoon, Booth had asked him in front of several other people, you know, I need some help tonight. Can you help me out, Ned? And without specifying what it was that he needed. And poor Ned Spangler said, sure, John, I'll help you all I can. And as a result of that, uh, during the trial, and a lot of the testimony against Spangler uh, was delivered by a man named Jake Rittersbach, who I'm pretty sure was a spy backstage. He'd only been working there three weeks, and he asked a lot of questions. He was a union veteran, too. And on his testimony, Spangler is sentenced not to death, fortunately, but to six years of hard labor at Fort Jefferson, uh, and that's down in the Dry Tortugas. I've yeah. been down there, and it's a really bleak place. It's 70 miles, Floridians will know this, off the coast of Key West. Uh, nothing but the fort out there on the island, and uh, he was down there until he was pardoned by President Johnson. As where they sent uh, Samuel Mudd, the doctor that... Mudd uh, that, and Arnold uh, and McLaughlin. And, yeah, um, yeah. Uh, McLaughlin uh, died when he was down there. And uh, the, uh, it's, it's a pretty hard place to get to, but it's, it's, a, it's, it's well, very well preserved. It's, uh, Park Service has done a great job with it. And uh, for people who are also interested, it's a great place for scuba diving. Uh, Tom, let me ask you this. What did you, uh, you know, how long, number one, how long did it take you to put the book together? Uh, and, and your takeaway from the book, your feelings as, as you completed the work on this? It was eight years total wow. um, working on this, and it really became a labor of love. These people became so alive to me and individualized. I've even been to the graves of some of them uh, and, and told them that I'm going to be telling their story, and I hope I do it well. Uh, the takeaway for me really was how individualized they became. I found myself talking to them. Uh, there's, there's a great quote I found by Charles Dickens. Uh, he said that, that ideas like ghosts have to be spoken to a while before they'll explain themselves. And I found myself talking to these people, you know, trying to get them to explain themselves, uh, what had brought them to that point. And, and I, I came away with a much greater appreciation for their individual talent and really a greater appreciation for Abraham Lincoln's uh, character and his love of the theater. 
I must say, my first visit to Ford's Theater was probably over 50 years ago. I was a young child visiting Washington, D.C. with my grandparents. And, uh, uh, of course, uh, Ford's Theater today has greatly changed from what it was 50 years ago, even. And, and, and there are now, uh, again, live performances and whatnot. And uh, it is open to the public. When you go to Washington, D.C., you can visit this place and, and perhaps feel the history. You can walk across the street to the house where Lincoln was killed. Well, uh, the book is Backstage at the Lincoln Assassination, the untold story of the actors and the stagehands at Ford's Theater. It is by Dr. Thomas Bogar. Uh, again, he's got a, his doctorate in, in uh, the history of theater, and it makes it tremendously interesting. Uh, five stars from us uh, for a, a, a new piece of informative history, one that had gone uh, unsung for too long. Tom, thank you for being with us this day. Uh, the book available at Amazon.com and all the fine bookstores, and uh, we hope you'll come back. I, I loved being at with you, and it was great. Take care. This is the Florida Roundtable. I'm Reagan Smith. I'm Al Spry. And we'll continue our conversation in a moment. We're back. You're listening to the Florida Roundtable, a service for Florida's talk and entertainment networks, and in the Orlando area of Tough TV 38. I'm Reagan Smith. I'm Al Spry. And uh, enjoyable conversation there with Dr. Tom Bogar. Uh, a, a new twist, if you will, uh, a new view of, of the uh, Lincoln assassination. I like the way he put it, kind of turned it around 180 degrees and looked at it from the other side of the audience. You yeah, know, I like that. I, I, it was, I never read anything like it's that. It's pretty before. cool, the yeah. perspective. <laughs> yeah. So there's always something new you can learn about history that, that, that nobody has tackled before. You know, it's, uh, uh, it, gives, it gives lie to that business of nothing new ever happens. Here we are 150 years later and he found new a- aspects. Yeah, no uh, kidding. Yeah. So anyhow, uh, let's see here. Florida legislature coming down the home stretch of the uh, 2014 session. It goes quickly, doesn't it, Oh, Reagan? boy, does it. Wow. Well, we have a lot of, uh, lot of uh, what do you call it, uh, trading and a lot of uh, negotiation, a little haggling here yep. going on with the House and Senate. Uh, we have um, we have a proposed spending of $75 billion. <laughs> Lawmakers have wow. already agreed on $500 million in tax and fee cuts. Uh, five hundred and eighty million to cover unfunded liabilities in the retirement system, three billion in reserve, so we don't eat our seed corn, according to uh, mm. Senate President Don Getz. Isn't that just kind of a folksy way of saying it? Don't eat our seed corn. I like sweet corn myself, but oh, I oh, do. I'm sorry. That's <laughs> <laughs> you're making me hungry again. <laughs> then of course there's uh, there's uh, some winners here. Okay. So we have uh, the Clearwater's Marine Aquarium. The House budget proposes $4 million for the aquarium, which received $5 million last year, partly because Dolphin Tail 2 is being shot there. Uh, the Senate only proposed $1 million, but doubled its offer uh, with its first offer to the House. Other winners include BMX Training Facility in Oldsmar, which the Senate budget didn't uh, uh, produce initially. Uh, it offered 750000 to come closer to the House proposal of spending $1.2 million on it. Uh, traffic enforcement sent it through in about 500000 more and upping offers to match the House to replace Florida Highway Patrol pursuit vehicles. Mm-hmm. And $3.48 million on enhancing traffic law enforcement. Uh-oh, more red light cameras. <laughs> <laughs> now, some communities are going the other way and throwing them out, you know, down around Palm Beach and then Claremont. And That's but, what I wish we were doing hmm, in Popka. Yeah, I hear you. Florida African American Heritage Preservation Network uh, is getting $400,000. Okay. Uh, Port St. Joe's Historic Cape San Bias Lighthouse Complex Rescue and Relocation Project. It's going to get uh, 200000 more. It got 325000 last year. So there's some interesting stuff going on uh, as far as the budgeting. Uh, but there's yeah. losers, too. Okay. Visit Florida, which saw the Senate shave $1 million from its proposed budget mm. and offer $30.5 million to the state's tourism agency, moving it closer to the House's Twenty-seven point eight million. Still a nice chunk of change, though. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, other losers so far: Skyrise Miami, the Tower Amusement Ride in downtown Miami, hmm. has ten million in the House budget. The Senate proposed spending nothing on it, uh, so uh, doesn't want to. We may not see Skyrise Miami. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I. <laughs> I'm, not I'm, that that matters. I guess people in Miami like Skyrise Miami, but. 
Yeah. Well, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm waiting to see the Orlando wheel, like the one that they have in London and the one in Singapore. It's going to be 400 feet tall. Yeah. And what are you going to look at when you're on the top of it? Uh, the sky. <laughs> okay, because Central Florida is flat, you know. I mean, <laughs> look at the lovely <laughs> mountain the... <laughs> ranges of the lovely Mount Dora. Uh, and, uh, that, yeah, yeah, I guess that's uh, it. Yeah, uh, be... U.S. Supreme Court rejects Rick Scott's request to review mm. drug testing. Uh, the U.S. Supreme Court on Monday said no. We will not review a lower court ruling that his drug testing policy for state employees was unconstitutional. A little slap to the gov. Uh, the decision was a victory for labor unions and their legal advocates. So uh, the court's action leaves in place an 11 U.S. Circuit Cor- Court of Appeals ruling that Scott's executive order making consent to suspicionless drug testing a condition of employment unconstitutional, violated workers' Fourth Amendment rights, though it allowed for certain exceptions in safety-sensitive categories for employees. And on that note, we take a pause along the network line. I'm Reagan Smith. I'm Al Spry. You're listening to the Florida Roundtable. Our conversation continues in a moment. We are back. You're listening to the Florida Roundtable, the service of Florida's talk and entertainment networks. And in the Orlando area, we are seen on TV 38. I'm Reagan Smith. I'm Al Spry. And uh, we got a couple of more minutes to fill here, Al. Uh, why don't we go back and see if we can uh, expound a little bit more where we started at today, and that is uh, our situation in the Ukraine. Yes, Ukraine, of course, is the big geopolitical hot issue um, it's kind of interesting that we're back dealing with Russia again. It's kind of like the good old days, Reagan. Mm-hmm. You know, the good old Cold War days. Yeah. Before all we started yeah. talking about was terrorism, terrorism, terrorism. Kind of gives me a warm, fuzzy feeling in a way <laughs> to just be dealing with the Russians. I still think that the Russians are more sane than these terrorist guys. So well, I'd rather yes, I'm, I'd rather yeah. be at odds with the Russians, to tell you the truth, than to be at odds with the, you know, Islamic fundamentalists who are... Woo, boy. Yeah, yeah, if you gave me a choice of Mikhail Way Gorbachev there, man. or... Uh, or, or uh, Osama. Yeah. Or his, and his yeah, minions. Yeah, well, he's not around anymore, there, thank there goodness. Go. Yeah. Well, here we go. So, um, so we have this Geneva Agreement supposedly in place, uh, supposed to de-escalate the crisis. But then the president was just quoted as saying, quote, I don't think we can be sure of anything at this point, unquote. So he's confused and perplexed, mm-hmm. which is probably not a good sign. I, um, I, I think that the Geneva Agreement is probably not worth the paper that they wrote it on. Well, yeah, kind of uh, like the uh, kind of like another agreement you were just re- alluding to earlier with Neville yeah. Chamberlain, the yeah. famous Munich Agreement. Yeah. Uh, we could still see some civil war in the Ukraine. How would this affect uh, American national interests? Could, these are good questions to ask. Could well, Ukraine they, become the 21st century echo, echo of the Balkans? Remember with the sure. collapse of Yugoslavia? Oh, sure, sure. Uh, we had civil war between the Serbs, the Croats, the Bosnians. Uh, let's just say that this is a very, very pensive time right now uh, because uh, Ukrainian authorities – may be unable to restore law and order. It's a mess over there. We've got pro-Russian demonstrators occupying buildings. We now find out we have Russian special forces over there creating some havoc. Uh, the Russians want Ukraine back. I mean, how, will, how, how yeah. far are they going to be willing to go? And you throw Joe Biden into the mix, who is telling the Russians to stop talking and start acting. And, of course, they're not paying any attention to him. Uh, Mr. Putin's position can be that he has no control over the Russian citizens, uh, the, the Russian ethnicity that lives in eastern Ukraine. And, the, the, and Putin knows that the, the American people don't want to fight another war on another front. So this, was, this is the problem of going to such long, through such long wars, which, folks, we're still at war. I don't know. If you, if we don't talk uh, about it anymore. The Department the, of Defense officially says Afghanistan is the longest war we have ever been in. Right. It went past, it went flying past Vietnam a year ago. So we're still in Afghanistan. Why? I still don't know why we're still there. But it weakens us when we're needed in places like Ukraine for real purposes. Okay, folks? But, uh... But I don't know. It, it, it really is a very uh, scary situation over there. I feel for the Ukrainian people. They're getting caught in the middle of this vice. Uh, I don't know how we're going to be able to respond effectively at this point. All we can do is saber rattle. 
what else can we do? I don't see another uh, another. But we don't. Uh, do they? You know, they've anything taken happened besides sanctions, right? No, they they and and they really haven't sanctioned the government. They sanctioned Mr. Putin's friends, his wealthy friends in business, and smack their fingers. It's not uh, official sanctions against the government at this point. No. So uh, it's not being handled very well. Obviously, there are chapters yet to be written, and what bothers me is that we are liable to see them being written in Vladimir Putin's handwriting and not in an American handwriting. Yeah, that's what so, I think. Um, I think I think Putin is just he's he's able to outleader Obama yeah. at this point. Well, much more to be said about that and we will as the days and weeks go by. Right now it's time for us to say thank you for your time. I'm Reagan Smith and I'm Al Spry and we will see you again in one week with another edition of the Florida Roundtable. You've been listening to Florida Roundtable, a weekly look at issues and problems of concern to Floridians from a state, national, and international perspective. Presented by the Florida News Network with your hosts, Reagan Smith and Al Spry. The views and opinions expressed during the preceding program are solely those of the participants and not necessarily those of this station's ownership, management, or sponsors of FNN. Your views and opinions are welcome. Address your card or letter to Florida Roundtable in care of Reagan Smith, 2500 Maitland Center Parkway, Suite 407, Maitland, Florida, 32751. Or you may email ReaganSmith at FNNOnline.com. Thank you for listening, and please join us again next week for another edition of Florida Roundtable.